the modern world. Electricity, the internet, cars, democracy. The information age owes a great debt to groundbreaking thinkers of a bygone age. It can be so easy to take scientific achievements for granted, but actually the way we think and discover in the modern age is dramatically different to how it was only a few centuries ago. I'm going to take you on a journey through the imagination and endeavours of three thinkers essential to life as we know it. John Locke, Galileo Galilei and René Descartes are three names which will go down in history as the founders of the modern world. In 1618, Europe was on the brink of one of the largest and most devastating wars to have ever happened on the continent. The scale and proliferation of destruction was unrivalled until two world wars almost three centuries later. It completely changed the landscape of Europe. Borders were redrawn, power structures altered, and a quarter of the population of the Holy Roman Empire died in conflict and from famine. The Thirty Years' War was between the Catholic and Protestant leaders of Europe, and despite three decades of fighting, neither side was really victorious. It achieved almost nothing. What it did do, though, was help people believe that a unity of thought wasn't essential. Man's freedom to think became less taboo, even about the more fundamental questions of life. Great thinkers could avoid persecution, and the devastating war, so linked with the church, helped increase non-religious learning in maths and science. It's unsurprising then that the years before the Thirty Years' War lacked any significant new philosophical ideas, and those during and after contained some of the most important ever. During the seventh year of this conflict, a 25-year-old Frenchman rested in the countryside while serving in the Bavarian army. He meditated for days at a time. His name, René Descartes. His objective, to find the metaphysical truth of the world. But to do so, he did the exact opposite. I regarded as absolutely, absolutely false, false everything in which I could imagine the slightest doubt and see if anything remained among my beliefs. He decided that men make errors so he couldn't trust calculations. The dreams seemed real when in them, so everything could be an illusion to us. How can we trust the world we live in? But one night, while sat by the stove, it came to him. While I just wished to believe that everything was false, it was necessarily the case that I, who was thinking this, was something. I think, therefore I am, is the first principle of the philosophy for which I was searching. This revelatory idea sparked debate in no time and was the inspiration for two schools of thought which would divide philosophy for centuries. The European idealists he inspired take a sceptical view of the world from I think, therefore I am. Descartes used the example of beeswax to illustrate his point. We see it as a solid which smells like flowers and tastes like honey. But our senses can be deceived. When heated, beeswax looks and acts completely differently. But why? It is, in essence, still beeswax. Descartes said that a thing's essence isn't contained in how it looks or acts or smells, but in our own minds. He said our mind is over matter and implied that nothing of the world could be proven to exist except in our own heads. By proving some things doubtable, Descartes pioneered the scientific method of testing hypotheses by trying to disprove them. This is the cornerstone of the empiricist movement. The British School of Empiricism is regarded to have been founded by John Locke, an Enlightenment thinker who was both inspired by and critical of Descartes. I've had enough of this fiddling. He said of Descartes' metaphysical objectives, which he found vague and useless. Locke's purpose was to find truth, which he claimed to be a great lover of. A love of the truth is essential, but it is different to a love of a doctrine of proclaimed truth. Locke's influence stems from the lack of trust he used in his work. 
Dogmatically accepting previous ideas as true without evidence seemed foolish to him. We shouldn't entertain a proposition with greater assurance than the proofs it is built upon will warrant. Essentially, Locke decided that something could only begin to be judged as a fact if it had some proof to support it. For example, if I state that water boils if you heat it, then I'd have to provide evidence to prove that statement true. Similarly, empiricists say that nothing can be a fact if it isn't possible to find evidence to support it. So if I suggest that a giant chocolate teapot is floating in space somewhere, despite there being no evidence against the theory, we simply can't accept it as fact. Although important to empiricism, John Locke wasn't himself a scientist. The true pioneer of modern science came decades before Locke's theories. Halfway through the Thirty Years' War, Galileo published a dialogue concerning two chief world systems. In it, he defied the church and supported the theory that the sun, not the earth, is the centre of the universe. After years experimenting with motion and in mechanical theories, Galileo moved on to astronomy when he improved a design for the telescope and discovered the moons of Jupiter. This discovery suggested that the Earth isn't the centre of the universe as the Bible teaches. Publishing his work in direct opposition to the church meant that he was imprisoned for heresy. He was forced against his beliefs to admit he was wrong. I have been vehemently suspected of heresy that is of having held and believed that the sun is the centre of the universe and is immovable and that the earth is not the centre and that it does move. I abjure, curse and detest the above mentioned errors and heresies. Despite letting the lies pass his lips, Galileo supposedly muttered under his breath and yet it moves, defying the idea of an immovable earth. The symbolic disobedience the astronomer embodied is an inspiration to this day. It represents an eternal quest to find and spread the truth, an ideology essential to modern invention. Descartes, Locke and Galileo are all perfect ambassadors to this essential desire, and their example has truly shaped the way we live and discover today.